I'm Abby Wolf. I'm the Executive Director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. And it is such a pleasure to have you all here and to welcome our artists and educators um, for Breaking Boundaries, the Global Impact of Hip Hop's Original Dance. We've decided at the Hutchins Center to extend the celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip hop into this year as well, because 2023 wasn't enough for us. So, um, so it wasn't enough to capture the many facets of this remarkable dynamic global art form. And um, in a Zoom a while back now, like during the pandemic that I had with Lino and Paul, um, they made it very clear that breaking is one is a not paid as much attention to as it should be as some of the other elements of hip hop. So we're we're even more thrilled to have them here to to talk about it. Um, just a few run of show notes for you. We'll begin today with a, a lecture and a Q&A. For the Q&A, you'll come here to this mic. I believe um, Paul will moderate this the Q&A. Um, following the Q&A, there will be a very short changeover where we'll ask you to stand up while we move some chairs out so that we can clear some space for the performance that will follow, which we're all really excited to have here in the Hip Hop Archive, which is a singular space at Harvard and really anywhere. You're not going to find this on any. There are other places that say they have Hip Hop Archives, but not like our Hip Hop Archives. <laughs> so, um, and after the after this event is over, which will be probably a little after seven, we invite you to go right next door to the Cooper Gallery, which is our art gallery, where we'll have a reception to celebrate these remarkable artists and educators, and where you'll also be able to take in more of the early days of hip hop with our exhibition, Day One DNA, 50 Years in Hip Hop Culture from the private collection of Ice-T and DJ Africa Islam. So you'll, I mean, you'll all go as a group. It won't be hard to find, but you may go right out the door, walk a few steps, you're right there. Um, let me also add that tonight's program is sponsored by Arts Thursdays, an initiative of the Harvard University Committee on the Arts, which brings free arts events open to the public, hosted by arts institutions across the university of which we are honored to be a part. We are grateful to Lori Gross, who's back here, Associate Provost for Arts and Culture, Robin Kelsey, Dean of the Arts and Humanities, and Sarah Whiting, Dean of the Harvard Graduate School for Design, for their support of this initiative. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and when we were invited to participate in Arts Thursdays, it all just came together so beautifully, and we knew that we had exactly the right thing in this program to, to bring to you tonight. Um, I want to give special thanks also to our stellar events team for this occasion, Justin Sneed, Kingsley Carter, who's over there, Kimberly Lewis, and Jessica Dow. Um, and let me, I'll just be really brief because you don't want to hear from me anymore, I know, but I, I'll keep going for another minute or <laughs> two. Um, let me briefly introduce the artists to you. Full bios and their socials will be available tomorrow on our website, so you can link to that very easily. Um, I'll just give a few highlights here. As the award-winning founder of Mighty for Arts Foundation from 1998 to 2020, Paul Polsky Ruma is dedicated to preserving history, advancing artistry, and empowering youth through hip hop cultural arts. With a global impact in over 40 cities worldwide, Paul provides education about hip hop culture through community-based events, workshops, and documentary productions. As an accomplished b-boy dancer, world champion trainer, and respected historian of breaking, Paul has made significant contributions to breaking's development globally and academically as well through his courses and lectures. Next up, Lino Lean Rock Delgado is an award-winning DJ and dancer and a thought leader in the hip hop world. He brings over 25 years of experience as a historian, educator, mental health advocate, and practitioner. He's headlined major events, worked alongside music industry legends, and dedicated his efforts to educating at-risk youth. He was recently recognized by the governor of Massachusetts and mayor of Boston, both at the current ones, both groundbreaker trailblazers in their own right, but anyway, won't go into that, um, giving further weight to hip-hop culture and society at large. 
Born and next up are the, the dancers. Born and raised in San Diego, California, Logan Logistics Edra, who's sitting, I saw her, but there she is, <laughs> um, was seven when she started breaking. Inspired by local breakers and a B-girl a B girl teacher, logistics learned it is possible to thrive in the male-dominated scene of breaking. Given the name logistics by her father, the young breaker gained attention thanks to her high-level power moves. And she said something which I thought was quite lovely. Um, my relationship with breaking is very spiritual and also very tough. There were a lot of traumas and hardships I had to get through as a kid, but when I'm breaking, it helps me find release from those and balance. Breaking was born out of struggle, so I feel at home and like I belong when I'm dancing. When I break, I feel like a superhero. I feel empowered. And she is an Olympic hopeful for Paris in 2024, later this year. Victor Montalvo, known as B-Boy Victor, has qualified for Team USA for Paris 2024. You can see that this, in his story, you can see how much this is a generational art form and sport. He too was introduced by breaking, to breaking by his father and uncle, who were themselves breaking pioneers in Mexico. In an interview about his qualifying for Team USA in Paris, as breaking makes its Olympic debut later this year, he described his excitement about bringing hip hop culture to such a historic and significant world stage. And we're so thrilled to welcome all of you here today. So thank you. Turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Abby Wolf, for the intro. And good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> so we would like to thank Harvard University, the Hip Hop Archive, and the Hutchin Center for hosting our presentation, Breaking Boundaries, Exploring the Evolution and Global Journey of Breaking. I am Paul Ruma, known as Paul Ski in the hip hop world, alongside Lino Lean Rock Delgado, and we will, we will be navigating the dynamic narrative of breaking. We are deeply honored to share our knowledge and the story of breaking's profound cultural impact with you all. Over the last 50 years, breaking has evolved from the Bronx to a global phenomenon, attracting over a million practitioners. It has grown beyond just dance, influencing and reflecting cultural narratives around the world. Our objectives with Breaking Boundaries are to explore the historical evolution of breaking from the streets of the Bronx to the present day global stage. We'll gain insight into the social, cultural and economic impact of breaking. We'll also highlight local contributions that have shaped breaking culture. And then we'll finish off with the live demonstration by Breaking World Champions Logistics and Victor. Now, as a direct student of a New York City Bronx cultural icon and pioneer phase two, I carry the legacies of his teachings. He painted the origins of breaking with these words, breaking, that was all jump-started from the black folk in the community in the beginning of the 70s. Though most from the hood listened to a lot of the same music and clubbed out to the same jams, the styles were pretty different as far, and as far as dancing, as was the makeup of the spots. You had predominantly Latin spots and predominantly black folk spots, if not just about only black cats in those places. Now, with this vivid scene set by an original hip-hop pioneer, Let's immerse ourselves in an atmosphere where breaking took its first steps. As you look at the visual, I want you to picture yourself in a cramped Bronx room in the 1970s, the walls vibrating with funky music. You could clap your hands. A sea of people united by rhythm moves as one, an underground party where breaking was born. And suddenly, the breakbeat drops. A dancer steps up. The breakbeat ignites her movement. She's found that breaking point to go off. Some call it catching the Holy Ghost. Each step, each spin, every fiber in her body is a testament to the beat. Can I run that breakbeat back one more time just so you can feel it? 
That's it right there. Break beat. <laughs> this is the moment breaking transcends dance, becoming a voice, storytelling through movement. From that electric atmosphere, we turn to the godfather of soul, Mr. James Brown. His music and dance profoundly influenced the youth of the Bronx and sparked the creation of breaking in the early 1970s. Credit is due to his drummers on their drum beats, Clyde Stubblefield and Jabo Starks, who you see here on the bottom of the screen, and his entire band, the JBs, for providing the rhythms that allow dancers to become one with the breakbeat. Now this timeline is our roadmap for our presentation, tracing the pivotal eras of breaking. We'll explore each era as we move through the history of breaking, beginning with the essence, the blueprint, global expansion and commercialization, the dark ages, underground resurgence, the age of tournaments, international government support, global synergy, and Olympic aspirations. Now, are we all ready to take a trip through time? Yeah. Let's start it off. The essence, 1970 to 1975, capturing the original spirit and pure beginnings of breaking. In the early 1970s, African-American dancers were mastering top styles fueled by the essence of funk, rock, and soul music. This period introduced terms for the dance like burning, going off, breaking, and boyoing. Pioneers of this generation taught us the importance of precision and funk in our dance. If you were off time or non-rhythmic in the slightest bit, they would pay you no mind. It was a bad look to have no rhythm. To the left, you see Cisco Kid in black, demonstrating a top rock style. In the middle, in blue, you see Keith from the legendary Twins. And to the right, in white, Pee Wee Dance. They are all showcasing an early 1970s breaking style. As the mid 70s approached, the dance expanded to include intricate floor work. Little Boy Keith of the Zulu Kings displays what's known as footwork in this clip. And by the decade's end, the breaking scene was diversifying with African Americans branching out into other dance styles and other artistic expressions. Moving into the blueprint era from 1975 to 1980, we see the formative years where the foundation of breaking was solidified. During this time, Latinos greatly influenced breaking, introducing a regimented format and new moves. This format has become the universal standard in breaking and the format that you see today. As a Latino growing up, learning this history made me very proud of my roots and my heritage. On this slide, you'll see the fundamental elements that make up breaking. The first component of breaking is top rock. Top rock is the initial upright dance sequence you can see here performed by Ken Swift. It embodies the essence of rhythm and timing, serving as the most important part of the art form. In essence, top rock is not just the starting point, but the heartbeat that drives the entire dance. Following top rock, you have your drops. This is the transition from top rock to floor work, as you can see here performed by Flo Frosty Freeze. Here he's dancing on top, and he jumps in the air, and then he touches the floor with the signature drop called the suicide from the upper west side. After the drops comes the floor work. Floor work encompasses footwork, air moves, spins. As you can see here, performed by Ken Swift, he's doing footwork, legs, he's doing air moves, and action, doing spins in the bottom. Just to give you further context, there are countless other moves that make up floor work that have not shown here. And then finally, a breaking ends. A breaking round ends with a freeze. This is a signature pose that punctuates a breaking round, as you can see here, performed by Quick Step. Right there. 
This is how a breaker puts their period to their physical sentence. These components are the building blocks of the breaking that you see today. As we reach the global expansion and commercialization phase from 1980 to 1985, break insurgents to the mainstream consciousness and gains international fame. Break and set international standards with pivotal tours like the 1982 New York City Rap Tour in Europe and the 1983 Wild Style Tour in Japan. These tours marked hip hop's first significant global impact, especially as rap music was initially less understood by international audiences. In countries like France and Japan, there weren't a lot of English speakers in the audiences. So it's clever to understand why, it's clear to understand why Breakin' served as the first universal language of hip hop. In 1984, the Fresh Festival, also known as the Fresh Fest, was the first hip hop national tour that included major rap acts alongside Breakin' crews like the Dynamic Breakers and Magnificent Force. This was the first national major hip hop tour. And then we have the Swatch Watch World Breakdance Championship, which further contributed to this cultural dissemination being the first world championship in breaking. <coughs> Films like Star Wars and Wild Style in 1983 captured the hearts of global audiences, making breaking synonymous with hip hop culture. Both Star Wars and Wild Style captured an authentic view on hip hop culture in its early form. In 1983, a cinematic hit brought Breaking to the big screen featuring a segment with the Rocksteady crew performing in an alleyway. I don't know about anyone else in here, but I would just watch that movie just to watch Rocksteady break. And to be honest, I never watched the rest of the movie. <laughs> in 1984, Breaking in Beach Street showed the world the energy of hip hop culture. One iconic scene in Beach Street is the infamous battle between Rocksteady crew and the New York City Breakers at the legendary New York City nightclub, The Roxy. This scene and these movies made breaking a global sensation, getting people everywhere excited about this powerful dance style. And now we come to the dark ages, 1985 to 1990. Yeah, that doesn't sound too good, right? The dark ages, think about that. So by 1986, excessive commercialization had caused Breaking's popularity to decline both in the USA and internationally. Breaking retreats to its core communities in small pockets around the world. The phrase, that's played out, echoes worldwide if you were caught breaking during this period. Now this era really saw Breaking hit the mainstream, popping up in products, services, and media, which diluted its original spirit. You'd see breaking moves in popular TV shows and cartoons like G.I. Joe or Transformers. And ads, breaking was everywhere, from Hershey's Chocolate to Cocoa Pebbles commercials. I mean, take a look at Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble hitting backspin to headspin combos. <laughs> this is wild, right? Every day on TV, you'd see that. For those who do remember, it was an exciting yet overwhelming presence and it was overload. I was seven at the time, and seeing breaking on the screen was the coolest thing. However, this mainstream adoption had unforeseen consequences that would later challenge the breaking community. And by 1986, the general consensus in the USA and around the world was that breaking had become played out. At this point, if you were trying to break in the public or in parties or in nightclubs, you'd get laughed at or kicked out. One of the many stories I've heard was at clubs they would throw drinks on the floor and even sharp objects so that breakers wouldn't take up space in the club. It was a horrible time for practitioners. Thanks to Linsky and the many pioneers that I've learned from for teaching me about those dark times and how not to take this dance for granted. Thank you. Now, despite the decline of breaking, in the US and international scenes, breaking was on life support, particularly in Japan and Europe, struggling to maintain its relevance. From the left to right, the Imperial JBs from Japan, second to none, England, Actual Force, France, and Battle Squad from Germany and Italy are all regarded as influential crews that helped carry the torch for breaking. 
By the late 1980s, Paris, France became a major hub for breaking in Europe. International breaking styles continued to develop in several countries. You could tell what country a dancer was from just by watching them dance. By the early 1990s, the USA received footage of the international breaking scene. The influence from these international styles from this time period re-inspired a new generation of American b-boys and b-girls. A heartfelt thank you goes out to all of the international crews and style masters that kept the lights on for breaking during this dark era. The underground resurgence, 1990 to 2000, breaking re-emerges stronger from the underground setting the stage for a comeback in the USA. The 1990s saw Breakin's revival through events like the Rocksteady Crew and Universal Zulu Nation anniversaries in New York City, the B-Boy Summit and Freestyle Session in San Diego, B-Boy Masters Pro-Am in Miami, and Radiotron in Los Angeles. These grassroots gatherings integral to hip-hop culture sparked Breakin's resurgence and community-driven economic boosts via Breakin VHS tapes, apparel, and events. This phase of breaking thrived on the energy of the cipher, where everyone could contribute, not just watch. These images capture that unity of the culture and the space of sharing. All elements were relevant, with DJs, MCs, writers, and breakers congregating together as one at all of these iconic events. And I'd like to point out, in these three images, New York City, San Diego, and Miami, all major cities with hundreds of youth displaying skills, peace, unity, love, and having fun. This was during the 90s at a time when hip hop culture had a negative image in the media and it still has a negative image today. But I'd like to say that these images tell a different story when you look at these circles and look at these youth and how they're getting down, sharing the energy together in the circle. While in Europe, events like the UK B-Boy Championships in England and the Battle of the Year in Germany saw massive attendance, elevating event production and reinforcing hip-hop culture and its elements in its entirety. As we examine each picture, starting with the UK B-Boy Champs to the right, you can tell by the numbers alone that they had a huge market. In the middle and to the right, Battle of the Year utilized stadium-like venues, enhancing production at cultural breaking events. By the late 90s, the USA reclaimed its leadership in breaking stylistic innovation, thanks in part to the inspiration from the UK B-Boy Championships, Battle of the Year, and the rest of the international breaking scene. In the age of tournaments from 2000 to 2005, breaking tournaments rose to prominence, creating new standards for the dance. The USA launched a national championship based on an open tournament style in 2000. The distribution of breaking on VHS and DVD spurred the growth of more regional styles, nurturing a sustainable ecosystem for the community. And highlighting this era, the Alpha Fame USA National Championship in 2000 marked a turning point for competitive breaking, which was co-founded by, by my business partner, Cross One, of Freestyle Session, and myself. This was the first time there was national heats and regional finals allowing breaking crews from all USA regions to enter the Alpha, for the Alpha Fame national title. Prior to this, events would primarily invite certain crews to major competitions, not allowing all who wish to enter a chance to participate. This model became a blueprint for breaking or organizers to follow in the decades to come. To the left, or to your right, VHS tapes and DVDs are heavily circulated and continue to inspire a new generation. It was our form of social media, these tapes and videos. These videos also became a source of income for dancers to organize and or organizers to sustain financially. Now, how many of you in here actually own a breaking VHS or DVD? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. <laughs> Damn, quite a few. Your VHS players still work? <laughs> You got some ancient relics, be sure to keep those. In the, middle and to the, in the middle and to the right, we have the championship events like the Red Bull Lords of the Floor and the Red Bull BC1 following this open tournament framework. These two events helped raise the profile of breaking in the USA, influencing new fans and dancers globally. 
And between 2005 and 2010, I'm taking y'all back, we run through a crash course. In the age of international government support, Breaking saw renewed growth through online engagement. While international communities received government for backing events, enhancing visibility and legitimacy of the scene, the USA's breaking community had no government support and largely stayed underground, preserving its original spirit. The notorious IBE in 2008 stands out as a groundbreaking event. It was the first breaking event to span a city in the Netherlands. Let me say that one more time. It was the first breaking event to span a city within the Netherlands. You could see it on the map here. Now, as you take a look at the map, I want you to picture 10 different breaking events all happening simultaneously for an entire weekend within the city of Herlin. Can you imagine trying to get from one venue to another and walking through a sea of practitioners and fans along the way? Picture having to take a taxi to the other side of the city just to get to an event that you didn't want to miss because everything's on a schedule. This reflected the new scale and official backing breaking was receiving worldwide. As you can see in their arena, it almost looks like a coliseum, like gladiator type arena, just from the picture alone. Much respect to the IBE and the Netherlands for their continu continued support to breaking and hip hop culture. Events like the R16 in Korea and the Shell Battle Pro in France also highlight the massive international appeal and government support for breaking. The production of breaking events within international countries continue to soar during this period. Take a look at the images. It's like going to a major concert, but it's for breaking. Pretty wild. Now, the breaking scene in the USA remains grassroots at this time, receiving no government support despite its global achievements. Unlike other art forms or sports where national or world champions are often invited to the White House in recognition for their accomplishments, no American breaking crews or solo breakers who has won world titles has received such an honor. This is noteworthy considering the numerous world titles that American breakers have won since the late 1990s. Additionally, I want to point out that the international tournaments that you see on the screen were actually drawing in crowds of normal spectators, families, non-hip-hop audiences by the, th by the thousands, indicating a shift in breaking, Breaking's global reach. The picture right here, the freestyle session, this was at the freestyle session Los Angeles at the Hollywood Palladium, where the crowd is 85% practitioners. This is a stark contrast to what we see internationally. You can still see, though, that the USA still produced great attendance in this era without any government support. As we move into global synergy from 2010 to 2015, Breakin's culture becomes truly global with its diversity of practitioners leading to a rich integration of styles. In this era, every major city around the world and points in between from the underground to mainstream host breaking events signaling a universal embrace of the culture. This global embrace is evidenced by events and organizations like Catch the Flavor in Poland, Camps Breakers in Gaza, Blueprint for Life in Canadian Arctic, Breakdance Project Uganda, Outbreak Europe in Slovakia, and Radical Force Jam in Singapore. It's important to note that there are so many more great organizations that are covering all corners of the world involved with the breaking community today. These programs and events celebrate Breaking's universal language and its power to connect people across diverse backgrounds. And we would like to say peace and well wishes to the camps breakers in Gaza who recently had their studio destroyed due to the war. Uh, we wish for peace to the entire region. As we reach the era of Olympic aspirations from 2015 to 2024, Breakin's journey takes an athletic turn. The global Breakin community rallies with the ambition of elevating Breakin to Olympic dance sport, a dream that starts to materialize with its introduction at the Youth Olympic Games in 2018 and to debut at the Paris Summer Olympics 2024. 
Over the past few years, the WDSF, World Dance Sport Federation, Breaking for Gold has officially hosted breaking qualifiers that have led into Olympic qualifications. I had the privilege of headlining as a DJ for a two historical events during this era, provided a preview of what's to come on the Olympic stage. So as you can see, that's me on the right at the Youth Olympic Games in Argentina, and then B-Boy Max from Portugal and Alabama in 2022, which actually Victor won. Here's a picture of me, oh sorry, with breaking inclusion in the Youth Olympics 2020, uh, 2018 and the anticipation in its debut at the Paris Summer Olympics in 2024, Breaking achieves a new pinnacle of recognition. Let's not forget this summer, a B-boy and a B-girl win gold for the first time. Let's give her a round of applause just for that. <laughs> for local con contributions, we highlight the Flow Lords crew who have made a lasting impact on the breaking scene here in Boston and globally. Oh. I will also be sharing information on my upcoming memoir, These Are the Breaks. Hey, hey. The Floor Lords, founded in 1981, stand as one of the oldest active breaking crews in the world, acclaimed both nationally and internationally. I'd like to add that there are many older crews that came before Floor Lords, but the Flow Lords are one of the few older active crews that have stayed active and consistent for all 43 years. <laughs> because of that consistency, the Flow Lords have been recognized by the mayor of Boston twice and the governor of Massachusetts. The Flow Lords' influence extends beyond the dance floor, including collaborations like the one you see above my head, the Saucony Courageous Flow Lord shoe, thank you Hip Hop Archive, for archiving this legendary shoe. Now, if you're a member of the 1980s Floor Lords, please stand up. Hold on. Please stand. Please continue. I know, I know your knees hurt, but I need you to continue to stand. Now, I need the 90s generation to stand up. Uh. Big ups to my dad, Leansky, Dash, El Nino, Mosby, Megatron, Mad. We all here. And now, Sir Rock a Lot. Aaron, oh, Aaron, I see Aaron. Now, for anyone in the 2000s and beyond, please stand up. <laughs> I'm from the 90s. <laughs> now that all of you are standing, I want to thank you all for your contributions to the city of Boston and worldwide. Thank you. One last thing, one last thing, though. I also want to take this moment to honor my late godfather, the legendary B-Boy Float, for his contributions and the impact that he's had on the city of Boston and the global breaking community. Let's give it up for him one more time. Okay, you guys can sit now. I know your knees are hurting. Now moving forward. These are the breaks is set to be the first comprehensive memoir in breaking that addresses the intersections of mental health and hip hop culture. With its release plan this year for 2024, it fills a gap in published literature on breaking offering an in-depth look at the culture's human side. So when Polsky originally approached me about this, telling me to do a memoir, I thought he was insinuating that my career was over. In actuality, I didn't think I did enough in my life to write a story. But then he tells me to Google search books based on breaking by a master practitioner. Instantly, there wasn't one to be found, and still very few books out today. His point convinced me it was necessary. He also 
emphasized the importance of building bridges with academics involved in hip hop culture to do this right, especially since we've never actually written books before. <laughs> so I would like to take this moment to thank some academics. Dr. Danielle Prince, from Stanford University alumna, Professor House Magana from Arizona State University, Professor Mary Fogarty from York University, Professor Emery Petchauer from Michigan State University, Professor Joseph Sloss from Princeton University, and Professor Amani Kai Johnson from UC Riverside. Each of them generously donated their time and energy to assist in the production of these other breaks. I hope that this book sets the standard and inspires our elders and master practitioners to share their stories on our art form for future generations to come. While there are topics in my book regarding my upbringing in hip hop, I share vulnerabilities that can relate to all humans. So with that being said, I'd like to share a passage from a memoir with all of you. Understanding the root causes of our mental health challenges is crucial to making logical and informed decisions. In my family, a legacy of abuse, abandonment, mental health problems, addiction, and post-traumatic stress disorder has persisted across generations. Writing this book helped me realize the importance of identifying and breaking the cycle of trauma. Sometimes we unintentionally continue the pain that our family experienced by repeating the same harmful behaviors in our own lives. I found it necessary to investigate my family history and pay attention to reoccurring life patterns to gain clarity about myself. By asking my relatives about my past, or about our past, I could piece together parts of my life puzzle and better comprehend my own anxiety. As I always say, the answers to our struggles can be found in the past. So thank you all for your support. Let's prioritize mental health, hip hop, and healing together. Be on the lookout for these are the breaks this year. Thank you, Lean Rock, for sharing. Now, as we come to the conclusion of our lecture, I'd like to review the objectives that we covered today. We were able to explore the historical evolution of breaking from the streets of the Bronx to its present day global stage. We gained insight on the socio-cultural and economic impact of breaking, and we hi highlighted local contributions here in Boston that have shaped breaking culture. Once again, thank you to the Harvard University, the Hip Hop Archive, the Hutchins Center for giving Breaking a chance to share its story. Peace. Thank you. Now, the Q&A. Thank you so much for that. So remember, if you have questions, about five or 10 minutes, what, what do you think you works for your Q&A? Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So if you have questions, come over here so that we can record the questions on the, on the video. Thanks. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hello. Um, my question is, uh, after this Olympic era, if you had a crystal ball to guess uh, what the next cycle or era would be individually, what would you predict? For me, uh, as you could see, as we went through this timeline, through all the different eras, it has its peaks and valleys breaking. So whatever the case, I believe that breaking will always stay, be alive if it's dying out in one scene, it's growing in another. And that's been that cycle, this whole 50 years that we've seen it go on. So either way, there's always gonna be someone practicing the, this art form. Yeah, I would say that it's so global now that it's always gonna be alive, no matter what. Even if it dies down in the US, there's always gonna be an underdeveloped country somewhere where they're fighting for the dance. So that's my take on it. Hey, what up? Dart Adams. Hi, right, buddy. What's up, Dart? Don't trust public transit, um, <laughs> first off. Uh, first off, I'm glad that this book is finally coming out. Um, there's never been a book written from a practitioner's point of view 
this is in depth as this one is going to be, and it's going to cover a whole lot of facets of hip hop culture, especially in terms of dance, hip hop, and the uh, career of a b boy, b girl breaker. Period. That being said, uh, I know that we just spent uh, 2023 talking about the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And one of the things that we touch on in the book and all of us like hip hop, like practitioners and historians, basically it comes down to if we're talking about the rock dance straight into b-boying and then talking about hip hop into rap, hip hop, what have you, whatever you want to call it. uh, If we're starting in 1973 and you talk to DJs, practitioners, b-boys, breakers, everybody, uh, it's interesting that we needed to have this uh, creation myth for hip hop to be celebrated as a culture when it looks like maybe 1976 is a better indicator of all of the culture coming together. When we think about in terms of like one of the things you're going to cover in the book in terms of like the progression of DJing in terms of break beats for the people who went to the floor, you know, 1976 is the year that the first, we get the first 12 inches coming out that spring, and then that's when we get enough of the breaks. Because if we go back to 73, there aren't enough staple breaks that people went to the floor to dance to. So what do you feel about the the trans, the trans, trans uh, changing it from 1973 to a later year in order to have hip-hop be celebrated the way it deserves to be this past year? Well, to, to add on to your point, um, it officially was packaged in 1982 mm-hmm. during the first international tour. So. Yeah. Some could even consider 82 as the point of origin when, you, when, when you're speaking on that. But in terms of 73, I've heard this narrative since I was 12 years old, mm-hmm. reading the Source magazine in 1991, like through all those different uh, publishments. So at the end of the day, 73 to 76 or even 82, I think at the end of the day, these are just New York City cultural arts. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks. Right on. And thank you, Dart Adams, for also helping us with the book yes, as well. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, we know each other and all that stuff. Um, but one of my big, uh, one of my biggest uh, concerns about the culture is the Olympics. Sometimes I've heard things about um, about like uh, the Olympics uh, taking away from us, taking away from hip hop culture in general. So one of my main questions is, uh, what are we doing to combat that? And like, for an example, I feel like, you know, the hip hop has started here in the USA. Uh, that's a known fact. But there's also um, there's other countries getting involved. I feel like they're gonna try to change things and try to change the narrative and you know try to change the history of and, and all that kind of stuff. So. How are we combating that? Because one of my ideas when it came to the Olympics was instead of having the USA, I know this is kind of controversial, instead of having the USA compete, have them take a step back and we, could, we should be the judges because we created the dance. So that's just my opinion, but I don't know how we're combating that because I feel like the culture is a... Uh, we a lot of us are nervous that the culture is about to get taken over and and taken away from us in that sense well i'd like to to touch on that in terms of the culture being taken away when you're dealing with history and all of these stories if you notice what lean rock had said i had him actually google a book on breaking by a master practitioner we couldn't find any you could google it right now you won't find one see all those books right there you won't find one. Go look for a book specifically on breaking. It's going to be hard to find it. There might be one, actually. Um, shout out to Professor Joe Schloss if it's up there, foundation. the foundation. But in terms of a practitioner speaking on our cultural values and stories and everything that we, our pedagogies from the streets, this is where we as practitioners needed to step up. And with these opportunities, being able to speak here, it's an honor to speak here at Harvard University just to share breaking story. But this is where it, where it all starts, because as a practitioner, when academics would actually try to interview me, I would actually shun them away, like, why do I need to sign this form? Like, why are you guys doing this? Like, so in a way, we kind of closed ourselves off 
to the act academic institutions. And it's only later on in life I realized, like, wait a minute, our posterity is not going to last forever if we're not building with academic institutions. This is why we're doing it now. And if we could publish books, stories, and how everything is put together from our perspective, then at least we could say, go check out this book. Then you'll get it. In terms of like other countries, uh, you know, with their narratives, I mean, like I said, they have government support from all the internet. Most of the international countries have government support. This is probably the first time breaking on a high level in an academic ins institution was actually given a chance to really share its story. So we're, we're working on it and we're trying. And I think that Lean's book is gonna be one of the first things to come out along with other projects that we have lined up. Come to the mic, come to the mic, come to the mic. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. Like, if he really loves to do this, we're going to do it. I'm still doing it at 57. The key is education. The key is, the key is education and being humble enough to learn from other practitioners. And that's something that my dad always did. He allowed me to learn from different master practitioners and I was able to pass that message down to the next generation so it all comes down to education at the end of the day mm -hmm. yeah. right on uh, thank you so much Paulski Lima congratulations great presentation so excited on the book to come what an amazing contribution yeah you spoke early on about the influence of funk from a music perspective, and I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between breaking and funk over the years, how you've seen it evolve. And I'm thinking not just about the music, but I'm thinking about funk styles, specifically locking and popping, which came a bit earlier from the West Coast. <laughs> so in turn, I'm from the West Coast as well, San Francisco Bay Area. We were heavily into those styles as well, strutting, boogaloo, robot. So popping, everything that we're into, um, I think that it's, a, it's, a brand, it's another branch of street dance separate from breaking. At the end of the day, it's two different dances, but the same music within the funk. And I think that uh, I'm just trying to understand your question, like how do I feel about locking and... Well, specific, specifically, what I had in mind is I know that, that the breaking community in the early 90s with the likes of B-Boy Summit, when there was funk rooms, if I'm not mistaken, were really right. important to helping to sustain the funk styles that came a little bit earlier from a different part of the country and that through the years have continued to come together, even as you see reflected in the Floor Lord's history. So that's part of where the question was coming from. Yeah, no, totally. I, I believe that um, dancers, especially this generation, need to be a little more open to funk styles, poppers, lockers, strutters, roboters, vogers, whackers, rockers, etc. I think that at right now, because it's so competitive based, because it's a sport, a lot of the, the b-boys and b-girls are kind of closed off to even branching out just to even be in a cypher with other dancers. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a problem because that's where you get the funk. If you're in a cypher with a locker and a popper, something's gonna happen. Even if you don't even do that style, you're gonna start feeling it on that funky level. And I think that that's what a little, uh, this generation is kind of lacking on. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say. In the 80s, it was, it was all about, you had poppers and breakers and lockers all dancing in a group in the same group. Right. You had, you know, you had the Bluegrass Band, you had the Exactly. Shout out to Megatron. Shallow. 
fast. Domino. Oh, the Baker, yeah. Planet Rock. <laughs> um, how y'all doing? My name is Megatron. I've been rocking with the Flow Lord since 1981-ish, two-ish. And um, I just want to say, kind of like what the brother was saying about um, dancing in the clubs. Um, a lot of us, myself, Shallow, Dre, Dash, a lot of us, we battled them cats in the clubs on a nightly basis. Every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're battling. We're going there to battle for supremacy. We're going to battle for our name. We're going to battle for who's the funkiest, who's the nastiest every single week. Um, by the clubs being gone, you don't get that anymore. You get a lot of watered down dancers. I'm sorry, I have to say what I gotta say. There's a lot of watered down dancers and it's like no one has the heart and soul to battle the way you're supposed to be battling, especially in popping, okay? So B-boys are very fierce when they battle. They're, they're out to kill. They're always out to kill. Poppers had that same feel, right? Nowadays, it's like, uh, you go first. I'm scared. Like, all I'm trying to say, basically what I'm trying to say to these two brothers is, we have to bring back that same high power energy in all the dances. Locking, too, because locking was a, a fierce form, too, where if you didn't have the funkiest moves or the funkiest ways to jump up and be acrobatic or in popping, if you didn't have funky ways to go down to the floor and come back up with smooth technique and cleanliness, that's the thing. Everyone just want to jump around and just do anything. That's not, that's not, that's not it. That's the best I can tell you. That's not it. All I'm saying is, in a nutshell, is for when we're battling, battling is about what's in here. Battling is about showcasing what you know and what you have right now. And battling is showcasing what you practiced and how it affects the circle or the cipher when you execute a new move or when you execute your new style or when you execute uh, something that you want people to see. So that's what you got to bring. You got to bring that high level of electricity. And right now the culture is lacking in that. And we need to bring that back. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, John. Come on, Lane. This will be the last. All right. I'm just going to say this right now. This dance has also helped a lot of us get through a lot of different things. So mental health is really a big big thing in this dance you know we actually came from hard places you know we are some of us ain't here right now you know what i'm saying god bless to those floor lord members and other members around the world who passed away through this dance or just through not being able to um survive the streets you know survive the peer pressure so just understand that this dance is just not about to us it's just not about um, the dance. It's about us giving back, you know what I'm saying? And not just giving back, also learning from the younger generation because the younger generation is who shares what they're going through to us, which actually helps us get better, you know, as elders, you know. So just remember that this, this dance, a lot of us wouldn't be here. A lot of us would be in jail. A lot of us would be dead. You know, we grew up in some real harsh times, you know, the 80s, the I grew up in the in 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 Boston, Boston New York, New York, Boston, 80s, 70s, yeah. late 70s. Yeah. And if you look at it, you will definitely see murders were like, you know, 150 to 200. And we would be at these parties 
we were we were lucky to survive these parties. There were shootings at these parties. I can't even name like how many times I, I was shot at. We know, tell them the story. No, I'm not telling no story. That's it. We're just going to get right there. Right, right. All right. Nino, you got one last question. We gotta start this question, I, I think this question is important. Um, so I grew up in the 90s going to events uh, like uh, Rocksteady Anniversary and a little bit later on in life going to events like Mighty Four. Where at those events, I noticed all of the elements which our events now, I feel like they're just breaking related. Um, this is a two-part question. So what can we do to sort of bring, you know, to educate uh, the promoters now and bring the elements of hip-hop back together? Because I do miss that. That's question number one. Question number two, um, this dance grew up, inner city kids made it up. It came from, you know, their hearts, their spirits, their struggles. Uh, what I'm seeing now as well is a lot of uh, dancers coming from the suburbs or coming from dance studios, not so much from the inner cities. So what can we do as well to get those kids interested in breaking again? So yeah. two-part two part question. Um, again, just reiterating what we were talking about earlier in terms of edu it's just education, ed educating people on what this culture is. And part of it is leading by example. So, you know, with, with Flow Lord's anniversary, United Styles, we have to lead by example with that. We have to include the masters of all these elements into our events to showcase, just to just give people influence and give them something to feel. And I think that's one step with it. Two, educating through books, workshops, I know workshops more so just like a table of contents. But a lot of it is just education on that. And, um, and then the second question was, how do we get inner city kids? How inner city kids. How do we them again? Hmm. Again, leading by example, going to these community centers that are in these neighborhoods and connecting. Yeah, it's all the answers are in the past. <laughs> so, so, just to, uh, I'd like to share my perspective with you on that. One, in terms of the, orga the organizers nationally, at some point in time, since you've actually been around and you've seen it for decades, you'd actually have to start working. And it's so easier now compared to 20 years ago to actually build with organizers. So one, it would say, hey, how would you feel about adding this addition to hip hop culture and these different elements into your event? You, you know, you got to build too. It can't just, we can't just hope that they create that atmosphere that you actually have to build with them and actually teach them, share information of the past the way it was. Because yes, when you do have all elements coming together, you're going to bring greater crowds. I'm almost positive the crowds back then in the 90s and 2000s were way bigger than whatever's happening currently in America. So that's one. And two, in terms of the inner city youth and getting them involved, it's more so about going into the hood, finding out what they're into, if it's another dance style that they're into maybe, incorporate it into there and just start showing up where they're at and meeting them halfway, the same way the elders came around. And I'd like to point out, uh, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. It's just, yeah. you really have to meet people halfway. Now, in terms of the elders that were speaking, I was a youth coming here since 2000. Um, I never went to the Freedom Trail. I never went to like see Boston. I would be in the hoods with Linsky and all the elders learning from them. And these are, were, they are who I consider my professors from the dance and the culture. So it takes a student to also be able to sit down with elders to learn what they went through. And the biggest thing that I could say that I learned was, like I said in the presentation, how not to take this dance for granted because of everything they lived for and bled for and for the ones who aren't here, what they died for. I cannot move forward in life without making sure that their stories that they passed on to me and Lean aren't published because this is where we're lacking as a culture when it comes to just academic excellence as well as just publishing. And we need to change that if we want to see our scene survive the next 50 years. Thank you all.
Okay. Yeah, last but not least, I'm not sure. Which, oh. I'm the last okay. questionnaire or whatever. But um, first of all, I definitely want to applaud Paul and Lean Rock. Excellent job. Keeping it going. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Too. Yes. Um, to touch on something the gentleman had asked earlier about if we could visualize through a crystal ball and something Snap had said too that also made sense since we are the pioneers of breakdancing in America. Um, back to the crystal ball situation. Um, 40, let's say 40, so we've been doing it 43 years. Mm -hmm. Let's say 45 years ago, pretty much we were teenagers. We were young. There wasn't a rule book. It's just like kids today. It was a natural phenomenon. Kids outside having fun. Our fun at the time, breaking was new. That was the thing to do. So looking forward through the crystal ball, two of the most prestigious honors one can gain in life, let's say, or accomplishments, would be number one, a Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not sure if anyone in here has one, because I don't. <laughs> number two, reaching the Olympics. So as teenagers in that crystal ball, we would have never thought that breaking would have made it to the Olympics. That's right. That was probably not nowhere in anyone's mental world decks at that time. And, and even now, some people are still unaware that breaking has made it to the Olympics today in 2024. And it's going down this year. So I guess everyone will know, the world will know. And back to SNAP. You're right. We are the pioneers. I feel what you're saying. We should be the ones to judge. Just like DJing, mixing. We pioneered that also. We should be the ones to judge, right? When it comes to that and hip hop. So hopefully I'm um, in retorting on what you said, what you had asked about the crystal ball, Olympics, number one achievement. Kids, like I said, in the hoods, just having fun and now winning the Olympics. That's how I'm looking at it. And you're right. Maybe one day, snap, we will be the judges at the Olympics when it comes to breakdancing. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Now it's time for the world champion breaking demonstration. Okay. So let's move these chairs and these tables. Thanks for all the questions. So now we have the live breaking demonstration by world champions. Victor, who's also going to the Olympics. And logistics, also world champion, who is in the Olympic qualifying series in May and June. So I'm just gonna play a classic break beat, actually the national hip hop anthem called Apache. You guys know Apache, right? All right, you guys ready? Yeah, yeah. That was weak. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's go.
Give it up to Logistics and Victor. Now, if you guys want to ask them any questions, but we'll limit it just to two questions <laughs> per person. The first question is to the young lady logistics. That was a beautiful display of B-girl-ism, high power moves, <laughs> rocking the beat right on target, right on, right on display. No wonder you're a champion because that is what B-girl-ism is all about. Same thing for B-boyism too. My question to you is how long did it take you to master not just the timing but also the flavor and the flow? of your moves. Honestly, first of all, thank you. It's an honor because breaking is one of the most difficult things I've ever tried. Um, but that's why I love it so much. Um, I've been doing it for 13 years, so thank you. Um, I would say the whole 13 years, it took me that long to feel this, this, whatever, yeah. And I do have to shout out Polsky and Lino because they were people to really tap me into the, the true essence of this dance. For me, it was lost a lot because I came in, in this era where there's so much opportunity and so many young breakers, really talented young breakers, but like a lot of people in our ear about a lot of things. So then it, it kind of takes away the fun and the essence of why we started breaking in the first place. So I had to unlearn those things for me to continue to have this passion for this dance. And part of that came with re-educating myself, like what they're talking about with education, learning from them. Currently, I'm learning from Lego as well, and then going back to my mentors and, and everything they taught me with the foundation of the dance. But I still feel like, um, I still feel like a beginner, and I, I think that's what makes it fun. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, I still feel like I haven't figured it out yet, you know? Um, it's really difficult, you know? It took a lot of re-education, like you said, you know, going back to the roots and learning about this dance, where it came from, and uh, learning from your elders. And um, those little things take your breaking to the next level. And to be honest, like, what took me to this level, this elite level, is just dancing because I love it. It's not for the competitions. It wasn't for the Olympics because we found out we were gonna be in the Olympics uh, in 2020 during COVID. We found out that breaking was gonna be in the 2024 Olympics. And uh, like none of this was any of my goal. It was just the pure passion for the dance and the love for it and just the yearning to learn about the dance because I wanna innovate and I want to create my own path in this dance. So that's what it took me. Thank you. One last question. We have one last question. Yeah. I have one question. It, it's in the same vein as um, this gentleman's question before. But you know, something keeping me up at night about uh, loving this culture is, um, first of all, happy to see it grow. It, incredibly inspired by. Um, you guys are gonna be representing our country in like things that I did not believe would ever happen in my lifetime, so congratulations. But what keeps me up at night is, 
I, I've watched international competitions, and one thing that's missing is is the music. <laughs> like I'm not hearing um, Credible Bongo Band and Jimmy Castor and Edwin Starr and all that. I'm hearing some other break beats that um, are you guys still. I, he he's heard me complain about this. Like I, I just like can't live with it because while you guys still do your thing, it's it's not the same. Like luckily everyone here got to see you dance to Apache, <laughs> and you guys played with the music that. I mean, those records are so important to what everyone does. I've seen Megatron rip records like to shreds. So like, we need to see that. So as dancers, I'm, I'm just curious, like, how do you how do you navigate that? I know you never know what's being played, but it is not the classics we grew up with. That's a great question. <laughs> You're talking about the Olympic events. It is, yeah. There's been a lot of uh, adv advocating on our end uh, because it was so much worse even in the beginning of these Olympic com competitions. Um, so I think us complaining <laughs> was a great way to start making that change because it's natural. Because even we, like, we don't feel it. Like Every event we go to, we're always like, yo, I don't feel there's no vibe. And it's hard, but I think... I don't know if I can speak for, for other breakers, maybe, but I think that's another reason why I feel motivated to keep going because at, at these events, because I think um, when they see a dancer connect with the music, because you know, I feel like for me, 50% of the time it's whack, like the music at these events, and then the other fit, maybe 40, 30, 50% is good, is dope, like I feel it. But when, when, when a dancer is feeling it at those events, it will touch the audience and the breakers or everyone in that room in such a way where it reminds them, oh, that's, that's what it is. And that, that's personally how I feel. And oh, geez, correct me if I'm wrong. But this is how I feel when I'm at these events. And I feel like that's another reason I feel motivated to keep doing me at these events. Um, but it is hard. It's hard. <laughs> School me if you need to, please. <laughs> Yeah, um, the same thing for me is like super difficult because I grew up breaking to like the classics, the Apache and um, like all these, like James Brown, Turn It Up Blues, all these different types of classics. But to be honest, I've been competing so much that I know how to turn that switch on. So when there's a song that I don't like, in my head I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to dance to this song. But <laughs> you gotta fake it till you make it. You gotta act like it's one of your favorite songs, you know? So it's like, it's all about the feeling that you create. So I try to make sure that I adapt. I adapt and honestly, it is what it is, you know? And this is the path I have to take, all right, but I'm not gonna change my style. I'm just gonna add certain things into it and then I'll adapt. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make a comment about that. <laughs> we got um, people like Little Lean uh, coming out with their own music, and he's a big time representative of our dance. So, uh, as long as we have like more people within our community uh, creating uh, music that we all like, I think. We'll we'll be on a really good path and keep the the energy alive. So that's it. Lean on, lean, little lean. <laughs>